Great. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Astrid Garcia Ochoa, Deputy Director for Future of California Elections. Thank you so much for joining us today for our Designing for Democracy webinar. Um, our hope is that today you will leave with resources and um, ideas for improving um, your own county voter information guides. The speakers today are going to present on their own experience on what worked and what didn't work. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and introduce our speakers, but first I'd want to make sure that we acknowledge our uh, funder, the James Irvine Foundation, who has supported the work of Future of California Elections and its partners on this journey to improve voter information for several years now. Uh, back in 2012, when I was at Noel Educational Fund, I conducted voter focus groups to get input on the State Voter Information Guide, and this work has continued to evolve. In 2015, the League of Women Voters of California Educational Fund, in partnership with the Center for Civic Design, released its Best Practices Manual for Official Voter Information Guides. Um, and so it's really exciting to see that this work has continued, that there is excitement to really um, improve voter information guides and improve voter information across the state. So thank you for taking the time to join us today. We have um, a really great presenters today who have been working on this. Um, and I'll go ahead and do a brief introduction uh, now um, before we get started that we can just jump right in into our presentation. So our first presenter will be Gail Pellerin, County Clerk and Registrar of Voters for Santa Cruz County. Gail has 30 years of experience in public service, uh, 7 years working at the State Legislature in Sacramento, and 23 years serving as a primary elections official in Santa Cruz County. Gail served as the President of the California Association of Clerks and Election Officials from 2010 to 2012, and currently she is co-chair of the Secretary of State's Voting Accessibility Advisory Committee. Um, our second speaker will be Ben Hamataki. He is the Community Outreach Manager for the Orange County Registrar of Voters, where he oversees the translation of voting materials at the Orange County Registrar of Voters in Spanish, Vietnamese, Chinese, Korean, Tagalog, Japanese, Hindi, and Khmer. He also manages the recruitment of bilingual poll workers and poll worker training in general. Allison Denofrio is the Assistant County Clerk and Registrar of Voters for Shasta County, and she will be our third presenter. Allison started her elections career in Contra Costa County in 1998 as temporary staff, but was soon hired permanently to assist at the poll worker desk. In 2006, Allison and her family moved to Reading, where she began to work for Shasta County. Allison quickly advanced to supervisor, and in 2014, she stepped into her, her current role as the Assistant County Clerk and Registrar of Voters. Um, our final speaker will be Whitney, Whitney Quisenberry, who is the co-director for the Center for Civic Design. Whitney's work in civic design began with her appointment to the U.S. Election Assistance Commission Advisory Committee writing federal voting system guidelines. She brings to her work expertise in user research, accessibility, and plain language, along with a passion for understanding the story behind the data. She is proud to have worked on the plain language update to the California Voter Bill of Rights. And joining us also for the Q&A portion will be Nancy Frischberg. She is the Senior User Research Center, uh, sorry, she is the Senior User Researcher for the Center for Civic Design. And Nancy joined the Center for Civic Design in September of 2015 to combine her interest in literacy, multilingualism, accessibility, design, and evaluation, and democracy. Um, all of you, I'm sure, have met all of our presenters and know how very passionate they are about improving voter information. And I just want to say thank you to each of them for joining us today and sharing their lessons and their expertise with us. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Gail, um, who will be our first presenter. Thank you, Astrid, and thanks for everybody who's on the line. Um, so is my PowerPoint going to start? There we go. Okay, so um, yeah, I titled it, of course, Designing for Democracy and How to Redesign Your County Voter Information Guide Without Going Insane. And as an election official, it's important to maintain our sanity because if we were declared mentally incompetent, we would not be allowed to vote. So that's important to us. And I want to first say how excited I am about this project and working with Whitney, Nancy, and Drew. And thanks to the Irvine Foundation for their funding. I've been a supporter of plain language for years. And seeing it used in these voter guides has been really exciting for, for me. And lots of great tools. I mean, the Center for Civic Design is certainly providing a lot of assistance for us. They provide the templates that we use. We just download them and you can plug in your own material. The color palette is great and easy to use for the different colors you'll use for um, text blocks and things. The instructional pages they provided are a really good um, starting point for us. There's one that we're working on right now for the top two in a general 
but there's others on three ways to vote and how to vote by mail, how to vote on paper, how to vote an electronic ballot, uh, the accessible voting, we have a page on that. And their availability for advice is tremendous. So email, phone calls, I get instant response from them when I'm hitting a roadblock and need some help. And sometimes I end up just emailing the whole page to Whitney and saying, help, this isn't working, my pagination is not working or whatever, and she will fix it and get it back to me. And I've also enjoyed the partnership we've had with the League of Women Voters. Dora Rose was out here helping us when we were doing our usability testing, and that was real key. They've done a lot of work with the plain language and their easy reader voter guides, so incorporating a lot of those concepts into our voter guides has been uh, essential. And I think the main thing I want to say is that you can start small. You don't have to take on the whole redesign of your entire voter guide. You can start with covers or just the measure pages or pick up some instruction pages. Uh, you don't have to do the whole thing like, like I did, but I was part of the pilot group that started with this grant funding. So next slide, we'll show you a little bit of the before and after. So you can see on the left, my before cover, you know, it was pretty, uh, had some color, uh, but it was sort of, there was a lot of material there, not a lot of white space. And then the redesign, of course, is on the right, where you have more white space, it's easier on the eyes, it's less clutter, and it really just pulls out that essential information for the front cover. So uh, I like it a lot better. Um, go ahead and turn the slide. And then our next page here is the before and after of the measures, and I particularly love the measure page concept because what it does is it pulls out of the very front your ballot question, and we also provide it in Spanish as well. And um, my old version on the left, it went into the full text of the measure right after that, and that's really not something people want to dig deep into right off the first page. So I think this design with that separate section, what your vote means, what a yes vote means, what a no vote means is really key for voters who are using this guide to get the information that they need right off the bat. And we did pass legislation thanks to our Santa Cruz County Assembly member, um, Mark Stone, who carried AB 2265 for us, which was enacted into law that now specifically authorizes the county council or the city attorney to write this section of what a yes vote means and what a no vote means. So I think that makes it real clear and plain language for voters to know um, to help them in deciding how to vote. And then the next section there, for and against the measure, who's for it, who's against, I think that's another thing voters look for. Uh, who do I identify with? Uh, who's in favor of this? Who's opposed to it? And having that all on the front page provides a really nice snapshot of what they're voting on. So next slide. So I was I pulled this one out because I was very much you know, scared of doing a table of contents, just because every single guide has different material depending on which candidate statements, which measures, and how are we going to do this. And I, I really fought this concept, but I'm glad I uh, did it. So. What we ended up doing is having an English section of those standard instruction pages of three ways to vote, how to vote by mail, you can see it there. And then we did usability testing and decided instead of doing English on one side and Spanish on the other, we would do separate sections. So we have the English section and then we repeat that in a Spanish section. And then for the rest of the book, we just basically say what's in the, on the ballot for this election starts on page 12, and then it flows because some books will have lots of pages, some books will have fewer pages depending on what exactly is on your ballot for based on where you live. So that final section with that specific information to that ballot type on candidates, measures, I think um, that falling at the end works really well. So I'm happy with the table of contents. So. Very excited about that. And then next slide. I love, Drew has put together a lot of the graphics for us and I love using the graphics. So on the three ways to vote side, you see the little ballot that goes into the envelope for vote by mail and then that's repeated on the header on the right side for how to vote by mail. And just, you know, these pages used to be primarily written words with not a lot of illustrations, so I think the graphics really help draw your eye to the different portions. Uh, also, you can see on the right, the, uh, instead of bullets, there are icons that we're using for like a phone and a computer 
um, and the emails. So I think those, of course, on a larger page, it looks a lot better. But that, again, just helps the voter experience and understanding, you know, finding what they're looking for easily on the page. So then the next slide. This is more, again, these two pages used to be primarily written words and not a lot of graphics. So these how-to pages um, really come alive with the images that we have now. So um, we've had the standard graphic before on how to connect the head and tail the arrow, and voters do get confused on how to do that. So showing that image is really key, and then how to do it when you're doing a write-in. And then the actual picture of the ballot as far as what not to do, as far as voting for too many and an overvote to cancel out the ballot, showing what, how to vote it correctly, and then an example clearly of how to do a write-in. And then in our case, we scan the ballot. And on the right-hand side, we have the how to vote the electronic ballot, again, using those images that really help the voter understand what to do easily and simply. And then the next page. Okay, so then finally, getting better all the time, um, we're debating the use of sample ballot versus practice ballot. The code says sample ballot, and I think we are dealing a lot with law versus plain language. Um, Laying out the sample ballot pages, we did it, hor we did it uh, vertically on one page, and I think laying it out horizontally is going to be a better way because the font got way too small. We're working with building our books from cover to cover, and that takes a lot of patience. Um, online accessibility, we definitely need to do some improvements there, and we're working on testing on that right now. And I write, headers and footers are like teenagers. Uh, I fight with them all the time. They're really hard to understand. But I found that they have some really great features, and they can be, and they're very cool, and they're essential to being able to build a cohesive guide. And Whitney's come up with some great ideas on the PDF side that will add uh, headers and page numbers on the book from start to finish. So we're excited about trying that. And you know, advice: don't run out of wine at home because you'll need it. That's it. Oh, oh, I forgot my last slide. <laughs> we did get one phone call of praise, uh, which is really nice. Uh, you do this work and you want people to find it helpful and you want feedback, but we did get one phone call and they loved it. They said that it looked gorgeous, the layout was great, liked the fonts, uh, no serifs, and nice work. So this is a picture from our usability testing where we actually had Santa check it twice for us. So we're good. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Gail, so much for sharing your experience uh, with the voter guide and, and making those improvements. Our next presenter will be Ben Hamasaki, Community Outreach Manager for Orange County Registrar of Voters. Hi, everyone. Um, just want to thank everyone for, for being here and for this opportunity to share some of the things that we did at Orange County. Um, we did not get Santa to check ours twice, um, but a, a large part of our usability testing was getting out in the community um, and bringing the community in to talk about what their feedback is and their input. So what you see on this slide here is um, some of the elements that we adopted from um, the, the design from Center for Civic Design. You can see before we had um, some borders. Um, we did away with those. Um, but I think, you know, what you don't see on this before and after slide is is the work that went into actually deciding um, what's going to work. And so in talking about input and um, getting the best design, um, there's several levels. Internally, um, you should get as many players as you can involved in, in the initial stages of the design process. Um, if it's just one or two people, it's easy to get stuck into um, anecdotal evidence or, or thinking that this is going to be the best way just because the two of you agree on that. Um, it's, it's a little bit more messy at the beginning to have a lot of people involved, but you do, you are able to vet some ideas. Um, for example, I'm a proponent of, of two columns, as you can see on the before page, and you can see in the after page that um, we're in a full width, a full page width, um, but I did get a little bit of the two column uh, kind of compromise from my end with, with that calendar and the dates there. And so those, those kind of things, it's best to get them vetted out um, amongst a, a big group of people. Then once that in, those initial kind of brainstorming and, and idea forming and vetting processes are done, 
then you can really hone down on a, a limited team of the people who will be making the final decisions with the design. Um, there is a point in the design process where um, that the input should stop um, for at least that iteration. So that's kind of what went into the before and after process to that point. On the next slide, um, we just I just put down a couple of bullets on where we went from there. So once we had a general design um, to present to the community, we solicited input from um, our community groups. We have advisory groups. Language community is represented uh, in those advisory groups. Um, but we we had a meeting with all of them together, and we presented some of these images on the screen, got some instantaneous feedback there, um, right there in the meeting, and then we went ahead and sent the PDFs of these documents to the group, at least the, the preliminary designs, um, to get additional feedback. Um, one thing to remember in working with community groups, it, at least in the the order of the process we did is that at the point we had something to present to the community groups, we considered it kind of a limited review because if you were to open it up to a, a full review of all of the material, uh, then you're actually getting off track uh, from that project plan. And so we, we produced something that we could show to the community um, and then we implemented feedback from their input um, but it wasn't a full-on review of all the materials like we had done at the beginning of the process. Another big consideration is the uh, cost versus benefit. Um, we have 1.5 million voters in the County of Orange, and so even adding one page to either a mandatory page that's in the front matter or a county-wide measure is amplified 1.5 million times, just one page let alone you know several pages so those kind of considerations I think play into effect um, as was mentioned earlier looking at the legality of the things that you're doing um, but also we, we want it to be aesthetically pleasing but you know there's always that cost limitation and, and the budget limitation um, and so that was a big consideration uh, up to this point in, in the process for us then on the next slide, um, something that is um, kind of taken from the current um, concept of iterative design, meaning that you design something to a certain point and then you launch it and you learn from it and see what worked and what didn't work um, and then you go back to the drawing board and, and you iterate and you, you rerun that process to, to make it better. So we we identified what statutory language and content needed to be in there, what the order of the different documents inside the sample ballot were, um, all of the things we were required to do by elections code because oftentimes those run counter with some of the design elements that you would like to incorporate. So after um, that, and making sure that you're covering all of the bases um, legally, then you can look at the low-hanging fruit. What can you do um, immediately? What can you implement immediately? Maybe there are things you already know don't work well, um, and how can you address those um, you know, in this first iteration, in, in this first kind of pilot of, of the redesign? And then also um, identify desire paths. Desire paths are, that's just a term that refers to basically workarounds that users take. So I'm sure you're familiar with if you're walking down the sidewalk and maybe there's a gate across the sidewalk and then you see a path that goes off of the sidewalk through the grass around the gate and then onto the other side of the sidewalk, that's a desire path where enough users have made that workaround um, to get through the obstacle or past the obstacle or, or a shortcut from one side of the park to the other, enough people have used that same path that it, it's uh, becoming uh, kind of a path on its own. Um, in that example, um, a good iterative designer would look at that and say, well, something's wrong with the initial design. Let's pave over that workaround. Let's pave over that desire path and make it the actual uh, path of travel. So. Um, 
looking at the inbound voter calls, what kind of questions are coming in before the election, on the election, those will let those will clue you in into the desire paths of your of your voters, of your users. What are they doing? What are they looking for? What don't they have um, that that they want that you can put into that uh, pamphlet? Also, debrief the the performance once you launch, once you send that sample ballot out. Um, see how the inbound voter calls differ from the previous election, and then once you have um, that analysis of the data, you can iterate for the next election. And that's the nice thing about our industry is that we, we have these kind of events that happen on a cyclical basis. So you go through and say what worked, what didn't work, what, what can we implement this time, and how are we going to measure it going forward. Um, and so that's, that's what we've kind of experienced and what we're experiencing um, with our county, um, and we found that it, it works very well. Great. Thank you, Ben, for helping us uh, kind of flow through this iterative steps of, of how we can start looking at uh, redoing voter guides. Um, our next presenter is Allison Dinofrio, Assistant County Clerk and Registrar of Voters for Shasta County. Great. Thank you very much. And thank you to everyone taking the time to join this webinar. And a huge thank you to Center for Civic Design. So I kind of have a uh, like an everyday life visual comparison. So we all have a living room. We all have things that we want to display. We all have things that we want people to look at. So here's an example of a wall. We've got some pictures on the wall, and there's like a cartoon picture. There's a butterfly that might have meant something to somebody. Um, we also have books, books that are standing up, books that are being stacked, books that are kind of in color um, sections. We also have decor that's kind of stuck here and there, I see a little violin in there, I see a couple of busts. There's just lots of information um, on this wall. And everything is kind of put into some crated uh, shelves. So they're trying to get everything focused in, um, on, in one area, but where does your eye go? Your eye kind of goes all over the place. You don't know if you should be looking at the, the photos or looking at the books or the decor. <clears throat> so next slide. Uh, to compare back to our um, sample ballot booklets that we used to have. So we have the word sample ballot right in the middle. That pretty much catches our focus. So we know there's something to do about a sample ballot. Then our eye might drift down to the left and we see this big check mark uh, that says vote. And then off to the right, we have another little cartoon shout out, um, little guy with a big nose on there. And he says, you know, his polling place has changed, has yours. But what do we do with that? And then drifting down, we have this uh, big oval on the bottom with some color that kind of attracts your eye to that. And it's saying, you know, your polling place is on the back side. So now I've got to go somewhere else to look for my polling site. We've got the hours of the polling site. And then it's also telling me to save this to take to my polls. Then if you drift back up, you see our county seal, nice big black seal there off to the left. But then we also have it repeated, the county of Shasta written at the top uh, left hand uh, corner of the whole booklet here. And then we finally do see the uh, name of the election. So overall, information overload. Where do you focus? Where does your eye go? What is the most important information you want your voter to look at at this? And it's basically everything, but their minds are just going, you know, up and down and all around to the front to the back, and uh, it's just not real flow, not a good flow. So the next. We have um, our design that we use for this election uh, from Center of Civic Design that helped, helped us with that. We did take their color palette that um, Gail was speaking of earlier, and uh, we chose these colors to kind of blend with our logo because we are up here in Shasta, and so we have the beautiful um, Shasta Lake. So we have the blue in there, and then um, with the, the green of the, um, the trees and everything, we just kind of wanted to soften that up there with the gray. So we have the most important information right there. This is the, the, the pamphlet with information inside. Down below, we have our address and, of course, um, our, the hours that we are open. And then we've also used the little icons that um, uh, the center has also designed, so, which is a great visual for many people out there. If they want to know what the website is, they can see that little icon and follow that. Phones, the little hand of the, the phone, um, icon there gets them to our phone number 
So we just feel like getting the basic information on the front is uh, what we want to have for the voters. So on the inside cover, we have our letter from Kathy Darling Allen, our county clerk and registrar. We like putting out a personal message out there because this is information that we want to go out to all of the um, voters and then just personalize. Um, we feel like that's really kind of making a connection from our office out to them. We also had some real estate left at the bottom and we had other information that we wanted to get out to every voter, so we utilized that section down there. So the next, going back again um, in the past, this was the back side of our uh, booklet. And again, lots of information. What do you look at first? We have information in text boxes, okay? So there's our wooden crates. We have text boxes kind of you know, off to the side. There's some of our decor. And we have arrows. We have all different kinds of arrows going off to the sides, going down, going to the right, going to the left. And it's just, you just don't have anywhere to really focus on. But we want to get all of this information to our voters. So our mailings now, our sample ballot mailings, are in an envelope. And this is the postcard that's in the front part of the envelope. The bottom right-hand side is the voter's address, which shows through the uh, window of the envelope. So of course, these are going out to the poll site voters. So their most important information is where they're going to go vote. So we have that right above there. When they take that out of their envelope, they see where they have to go vote. Of course, the accessibility um, information. And then we have the precinct and ballot type. We uh, may have to have multiple uh, precincts in one location. So then we will probably have signs above each one, precinct 200 over here. What does that mean to a voter? But they see that on their um, postcard so that they would know to go over there. And then off to the other side, they might see precinct 210. So it's like, OK, well, mine says 200. I better go this way. Then, of course, this is um, also our vote by mail request. So starting at the top, just when it needs to get here. This is the address you're registered. Um, do you want it mailed there? Do you want it mailed someplace else? And then, of course, at the very bottom, their signature, uh, having the box with the X, uh, working with Center for Civic Design, that was um, a great visual to get people to sign on that box and send it in. So next. So we have taken this design and incorporated it in our poll site postings. So you can see here, we've got this blue and gray stripe on many different items that are uh, posted in our polling site and outside our polling site. There's the icon for the um, polling site, the little building there with a the flag on top. So we just hope that when people are driving around, especially on election day, and they start seeing this, that they will make that association that, oh, that has something to do with that thing I got in the mail about elections. So eventually, hopefully, they will connect it to our office, the Shasta County Elections Office. So off to the left there is our poll worker manual. So even um, not just our poll, um, not our election information, but we have also incorporated this whole concept and design within other aspects within our office, different desk manuals or public manuals. We have taken this uh, design and incorporated that. So again, it is a visual to our um, voters and to our community. So the next. So this is kind of my visual as to how um, even we as election officials see elections. There's lots of information that we have to provide to our voters. Uh, we try and make it all organized, um, but it can just sometimes feel like this big swirl of information. And we know that that is how our voters uh, can see it most often. So my last slide, we hope that it would be more presented like this. So uncluttered, yes, we have sections, but there's just a few items in each section. It's nice and clean. It's specific. You either have your books and maybe one piece of decor to kind of accent or bring your eye to that. Everything is sectioned off. There's this ongoing theme. They kind of have a color theme going on with this, so that's kind of with our stripes that we're using, so we hope that the, the voters recognize that. And it's simplified. It's just there's a lot of airspace. There's just um, one item to look at and focus at and concentrate on. So we will have voters who can take one section at a time and not feel overwhelmed, but instead feel well-informed. Thank you.
Awesome. Thank you for your presentation and sharing with us um, how simple design is really helping to inform voters. Our final presentation is Whitney Cleveland, the co-director for the Center for Civic Design and has worked with all of our counties presenting today. Uh, Whitney, thank you for joining us. Well, thank you, Astrid and um, FOS and Legal and Voters and um, Irvine Foundation. But most of all, thanks so much. Uh, I feel like we've all learned so much from each other. And what I want to talk about a little bit is how what, what we've learned through this process. Because while we had some background in elections, it's not the same as being an election, you know, being a registrar of voters and actually working through the election cycle. We have learned quite a lot about how to refine the best practices from our original 2013 to 2015 project into things that actually work in election administration, understanding the process and the budget, and uh, what we think of as the kind of unrelenting um, cycle of the, of the election process, where deadlines and events just sort of come at you and you have to be ready to react. And I also want to just give a real shout out to so many of what I think of as brave election offices who've kind of embraced this work over the last couple of years. Um, I think that more than any one project could be that the, the life that this has taken on within CECEO and within FOS um, mean that it will be um, living and ongoing, and we're even beginning to see places outside of California beginning to pick it up. Um, so let me just start with where we start on the next slide. This. Uh, all, almost everything we do is informed by usability testing, lots of it, and with voters. Th our testing is really the beginning of the community review process that Ben talked about. And one of the things that was so important for us is that we did this with the staff from each of the counties. We actually built a uh, prototype guide based on that county's information so that we were showing real stuff to the voters that they, had, that they might have seen before or that was at least realistic for the county. It helped us look at the variations and the kind of information the counties have to communicate. And we tested it. We're, our theory of this is that we go where voters are. We went to community centers and senior centers and public libraries, uh, sat in the hallway of county buildings, um, went to some college campuses, and even, as you saw, to a shopping mall. Uh, one of the most interesting sessions that we had was uh, the bottom picture on the, on the left, which is, was at a Vietnamese cultural center where we worked with students who were just coming out of their citizenship classes. So we were talking to people who were just on the cusp of becoming voters and learning from them what, what worked and what didn't work for them, what was overwhelming, what were their information gaps, and really thinking about how to use that information to make a guide that helped them. Um, I think one of the big things that we learned and have continued to learn in all of our research is how important basic information about what it's like to be a voter is for people who may have little frame of reference for the mechanics of voter, voting. They know about the big picture of democracy. It's the little pictures of what do I do when that can trip people up. So we tried to incorporate all of that into our templates on the next slide. Um, what I'm showing really quickly on this slide is just a few of the pages, because one of the big things we learned in the 2014 testing was how important, not just visuals in the sense of being illustrations are, but how important it is that each page have a kind of separate look. And I want to go to the next slide now to show some real pages out of the June primaries. Um, so we have lots of slight variations in the interpretation, but the shape has stayed the same. So the, the use of color and the cho choosing of color to kind of amplify your, um, your logo or something about your town, or in the case of a primary, to match the color selected by the Secretary of State's office for the, for the primary. The table of contents, um, Orange County added the icons to there so they could match those icons to the uh, same icon that was used at the top of the page, just as um, uh, Gail talked about having the icon carry forward from the three ways to vote to the top of the page. San Mateo actually made their own icons because they had a set they've been using, and so they used those in the same idea of three ways to vote, but interpreted it slightly differently. Uh, we have people who showed maps, um, a, a couple other pages, and the last two are things that came up, and for us this was one of those learnings that there is no election that's routine, uh, and the California primary certainly wasn't, with the two big issues of um, helping nonpartisan voters understand what their options were to vote and helping uh, people voting for Senate understand how to vote in our wonderful natural experiment of 34 candidates. 
so um, the thing that was important about all of this variation is that it's really helped us think through the templates. We've revised them slightly, not, not huge revisions, but we've done some kind of under the covers things that make them work better, make them a little bit easier to read, to work with. One of those things uh, Gail actually alluded to, which is the challenge of page numbering. We frankly had simply not thought about how hard it is to manage ballot types. And one of the things that we learned um, actually through one of the vendors, I was saying thank you very much, was that uh, if you, you can put page numbers on in Acrobat so we can assemble the, guy, the books and then add the page numbers at the very end. And that was really great because it sol we think it will solve a problem and we're trying it out for November. On the next slide, one of the things that we learned in talking to people was, again, it was about ballot types, which is how hard it was to figure out um, how many pages a guide was going to be for all the different measures and candidates who are running in the election because the number of pages of candidate statements might vary. Uh, this workbook, uh, this uh, you're looking at an Excel Excel spreadsheet file page, and it may look a little daunting, um, and it probably is a little daunting, but I have to say that the people who work on the ballot type problems looked at it and went, I get it. I understand what that is. So they sort of leaped in at it, and that was our first chance to get to grapple with the kind of tools that people really need. So let me just jump to the results of all of this work that we've done to date through the June primary. We have done a lot of training. We ran in-person trainings. We've been to the FOS, workshop, FOS conferences, uh, to CACEO, and in all we touched about 40 counties either with in-person training or with um, phone calls or one-on-one or, or -on -one meetings, and perhaps more. We didn't actually catch the name of every single person we talked to. And on the right is the uh, counties that adopted all or part of the, um, of the, of the guidelines. So. Um, we, it's, it's pretty impressive. Uh, we had seven counties, and I just want to give a shout out, besides the counties in our, in our pilot group, um, to give a shout out to some of those counties, um, Madeira, Nevada, Santa Barbara, Tuolumne, and Yuba, who just leaped in and, and, and went with it. Others adopted part of it. So you can see it's, it's pretty good coverage, and it made us feel pretty good that we'd come up with things through the usability testing, through the research, through working with actual real election offices that would be useful. All of this is online in a whole bunch of resources on the next slide. Um, we have a short link for it in the, hopes, oops, on, on the hopes that it's useful. There are templates up there. That little ballot type layout calculator is there. All of the icons and images are now on electiontools.org uh, where they're now available to everybody. We've arranged for a discount for the font that we thought is a really nice font. The election design color palette is there in accessible color combinations, so it meets accessibility. And um, uh, a few key tips on working in Word and Acrobat and on accessibility in plain language and using color and some ideas that we've gathered from everybody on layout for bilingual guides. So we hope that those will help anybody who's looking to do more. We are, as Gail said, happy to talk to anybody and help you out. And um, that was wa what I wanted to say. Great. Thank you, Whitney, for sharing these great resources with folks. We'll make sure to um, add those up onto the website um, as well so people can access those. Um, thank you to all of our presenters for their great presentations and really sharing their experiences. We, we heard from Whitney an overview of how the templates and their design work is actually developed uh, by meeting with the voters where they are. And um, you know, each of our counties share their own experience of what they're using and how they're learning. Um, and as, as Whitney stated, no election is routine, and we continue learning from each other. So this is an opportunity to, uh, to go ahead and, and take the, the learning from each other. And so we wanted to open up for questions. We have a couple of instructions that we wanted to um, share with you as I go ahead and I unmute the line. Um, you're going to be able to um, – you're going to be able to – uh, the conference has been unmuted. Great. So if I can ask everybody to, to see uh, you, to order, uh, how much was it? Uh, their lines. Um, and, and we can go order ahead. Order 200 in English and uh, 100 in Spanish. Comes to with a total of everything is $89.40. Uh, it looks like it's not. Well, if people have questions, please go ahead and, and type it in the this? chat feature. Okay. Credit card? Yes. Which one can I use? 
All right. Uh, we had one question that came in, um, and, and I wanted to go ahead and, and start it off with that uh, for everyone, uh, for our presenters. And what is uh, one step that people can take? Because it, it's a lot of work that you guys have been doing in developing your voter guides, and it was wonderful to see the, the final uh, uh, presentations, the before and after shots. But what is the first step that someone can take when they're uh, looking at redoing or rehauling their voter information guide? Is that for anybody to start? Go ahead, Gail. Okay. Well, I mean, for, for me, it was just taking one by at a time. You know, I started with the cover and um, implemented the design tools that Whitney has um, for the cover, and then I just moved on to the measure pages and you just started doing it one by one. And, and this is addicting. You start doing one page, then you want to do another page, and then before long it's the whole book, and then you're, you're doing what Allison did, you're all, all your guides and other signs and everything else that you do in your office. So it's kind of like um, I equated it to remodeling a house. When you start to remodel one room, you end up remodeling a lot more because it just you know gets carried over and you see places where you can make changes. So I would just say start, start with one piece, one thing that you want to change the most. Great. This is, this is Whitney, and I would just jump in on something, which is that one way to start is to think about redesigning the pages, that is, changing the look of, of the way the pages are. The other way to do it is to start by looking at your content. Um, uh, I think one of the things that happens over time is that we keep adding and adding content to pages, um, usually in response to thing, questions that have come in. So if we get a lot of questions about something uh, yeah, one year, we add it for the next year. Um, yeah, I'm just and down and so you could start by, by thinking about the content of the guide and how to simplify that um, even without changing the layout very much. So you could start in either direction. But the, the county I'd really love to give a shout out to is Yuba because they uh, uh -huh. left our training and a week later they called us up and said, well, we decided to do it. Can we send you our book and see what you think? And they had redone their whole book using the last year's book um, as a model in about two weeks. Uh, I don't know how much time they actually spent on it, but it was about two elapsed weeks. So that's another way to start, which is to start early. Of course, right now we're into an election cycle, but if you're thinking about this for next year, is to start early with your current work. And that gives you some time to play with it outside of the, you know, f rush of, of of the, you know, from filing to election. Right. Um, and actually, to your point right now, Whitney, uh, one question that came in was actually for Ben. Uh, ben, you shared that um, that you hear from voters in your iterative process, and there was a question about the call logs and how they changed before and after the primary in terms of any feedback you received. Yeah, so we're actually um, we're still analyzing the data from from June in terms of the sample ballot um, redesign, and and the thing to remember is that the voters. There might be a handful, uh, like Gail shared, where they call and say, oh, I like your sample ballot. But most of them are not going to say that because design is a lot of times invisible. So they don't realize that you made a better design. But if their questions change from asking basic things like where is my polling place to something more um, – in, in June it was a lot about no party preference and, and so forth. Um, so that's kind of – skewing it because that was a new thing anyway um, but but what we're looking for is a decrease in the number of questions around the things that we were targeting like is it easier to find where your polling place is is it easier to find information about vote by mail when the deadlines are and so forth um, and if those numbers go down um, the number of questions on on election day and leading up to election day in the phone bank um, then you can correlate that roughly to well we we did a a good job on that design front you know what, what can we do better and what are other areas that we want to tackle now thanks Ben I'm going to go ahead and remind people to please mute their lines um, you can mute the line by hitting star six on your phone uh, the next question that came in uh, is from Stephanie Sibley when will the voting in a top two general election be available to download? Hmm? I think that's probably that's that's probably for me. I have a draft just about ready to to send around for some review in our in our little work group, and then we should have it out in um, early next week. Great, uh, and then one more uh, as well. I think this might be uh, as well. 
Uh, Taylor Nevis, I'm really interested in adding the headers and footers in Acrobat at the end of creation. Is the same feature available in Word after PDFing? Oh, it doesn't matter how you've created your, your Acrobat file. So um, we typically either start in Word or a few counties use InDesign. Um, uh, and the typical way that we noticed counties were doing this is they would build all the pages individually and then they could assemble them. So they'd add the cover, they'd add the, all the voter information, pamphlet information, and then they'd add the contests that were relevant to one ballot type and the measures that are relevant to that ballot type. And that's what made pagination so hard. Once you've got this one big PDF file, then it's all done in Acrobat. Not Acrobat Reader, but the full Acrobat. Uh, you can add um, headers and footers, and we've got noted, and, and, um, instructions on how to do that on the website. Great. And but, but, but Whitney, the, the headers on the design pages, like the um, how to vote by mail, that's in the Word document. That's right. That's yeah. in the Word document. It's just, actually, it's just the footer we're adding. Uh, and that, um, that includes the page number, but it also includes the election and the county, because if a page gets separated, it's nice to know which election it was written for. And um, several of the printers said that they needed a place to be able to put a ballot type or a county code or some kind of control code at the bottom of the page because um, they just need to ha have it for their QA so they can do a quick check and not have to, you know, when you're, when you're printing thousands of piles of, of, of sheets of paper, it's nice to be able to look at an individual sheet and know you've got the right one in the right place. Right, and, and a question coming in for those that do bilingual ballots. Uh, did the usability testing that you did show that overall separating English from Spanish reads better than having English sentence combined with the Spanish? Um, Nancy, do you want to take this? Because we had a couple, of, we had a, f a few different reactions, and uh, yeah. I think they're all viable. Right. I think uh, what we learned, we had expectations, so we had our own hypothesis of how it was going to come out, and we were surprised that we weren't actually correct. So we had expected that facing pages would do very well with the English on the right-hand page and the Spanish on the left-hand page. And I know some counties like to do English on the front and Spanish on the back. But we were looking at this other version. And then as we started showing it to people and getting feedback on, uh, from bilingual voters or monolingual Spanish voters, uh, what they thought worked for them, we, we realized that the bilinguals liked it the way we had planned it with these facing pages, but the monolingual voters for whom it's really crucial that they find the right information in their preferred language, they like separate sections better so that all, they could skip all the English and go directly to Spanish, Korean, Vietnamese, whatever their language preference was. So the, that may be something you want to check out in your own county. And uh, as Ben suggested, you might want to look at um, talking to your community groups and showing it. Be sure you're talking to monolinguals as well as bilinguals. And you also are authorized to do usability studies without us being present. And one of the earlier field guides, I think it's number three or four, actually gives you some hints about how to do that testing on your own. And if you need hints, we'd be happy to do it with you and you know, give you the, the suggestions on how to do that kind of testing in your own county and so that you can do something that fits for your situation best. Let me, let me add one more thing. This is Whitney again. One is that if you're a county who does separate books for each language, then that's obvious. And I think the more languages a county is required to cover, the more likely they are to do that. The other right. is that uh, there are differences across California. Some counties um, have full requirements. Some have partial requirements for language. And what we see with the, the counties that have a requirement for full coverage in Spanish is that they will often do the whole book in English and the whole book in Spanish and blow the ballot into the middle of it. Uh, because that, you know, if it's the same number of pages and the ballot always lands in the middle for everyone, which is also nice if you're doing a two-page spread the way Gail talked about, because then those pages are right where the staples are and they're easy to pull them out and bring them to the polling place. Um, so there's some options, and uh, it's kind of a balance. You can't do all of it. I mean, you can't both do sections and, and facing pages. We do think that the facing pages work better than pages where it's English first, Spanish second. It looks funny when you're proofing the, the file because it looks like it's Spanish first, but it puts the Spanish on the left side and the English on the right side, so it's a facing, a facing spread. Um, so I think there, there, I, are, you know, there are some things about you might want to consider about your own county. Thank and you. then I would just like to say also about, I, you reminded me of one more thing, Whitney, and that was some people have uh, found that 
doing side by side on a single page for specific pages works well, and others have found that they've gotten people in the habit of looking top and bottom for the mm -hmm. two languages, if it's only two languages. So I don't know that we found any particular difference between those. Yeah, to quote the, um, some of the outreach people we've talked to, just please be consistent. I'd love to also hear from Ben. I know uh, we heard about uh, the Spanish and English, for, but Ben, um, in your county you have many Asian languages. Have you seen a difference or a preference for that layout? Yeah, we print separate, completely separate booklets, and we've been doing that for um, over 10 years now uh, just because the, you know, we have four other languages in addition to English that we're translating um, every single bit of uh, voting material into those languages. Um, so it's, I think when it's that many languages, um, it just makes, it, it makes it easier for the voter to find what they're looking for instead of digging through a bunch of languages. Okay. And Gail, do you want to add anything from your experience in, your, in, in doing Spanish and English for your county? Yeah, well, we did the sections, and I didn't get any complaints. So, um, and we do have some pages where I do have English and Spanish on one page, like my letter to voters on the inside front cover is two column. Uh, the left is English and the right Spanish. So, uh, and we're not required to provide the Spanish language other than the ballot questions. So, um, I think so far so good. It seems like it's working well. Great. Um, I had a question coming from Carrie, and she wanted to know if the font on electiontools.org, if it includes a full character set, including special characters for different languages. I don't know if folks are familiar with that. I think the answer is yes. Uh, this is Ben. It it doesn't include all. If uh, Spanish, it does, but it's not a full Unicode set. Okay. So you won't be able to okay. do uh, Vietnamese and and oh. character-based languages. Oh, great. Thanks, Ben. That's nice to know. Well, and this is Gail on the Clearview font. Um, so we actually use Clearview on a lot of the material, but for candidate statements, we moved it to uh, Calibri, right? Yeah. Um, and that's because I think it's a, it takes up less space. Yeah, if you, if you, can you, um, Rachel, can you jump to the extra slide 10 in my deck? Oh, there you there go. go. Yeah, you can see that, you can see that, that fonts have to take up different lengths on the line, and Calibri looks pretty close to Clearview. It's not that, you know, it's not that different, but it's a lot shorter, narrower font, and so it lets us squeeze just a little bit more in. Great. So we're coming to the end of our hour together, and I love our uh, presenters to take maybe one final uh, advice that they can share with, with folks as they look to redo the November uh, uh, voter guides or future voter guides for California voters. So if folks can take just one final uh, minute uh, to, to share their thoughts, and um, why don't we go backwards? I'll start with Whitney. I'd say trust your instincts. Um, uh, I think every time we've had a discussion about should you know is this plausible? Should we do this? Um, it takes it takes some bravery to move forward, but if your instinct is that it's not the right time for you, maybe it's not the right time. And if your instinct is that this is going to be something that would be great for you and your voters, then go for it. Allison, I would say trust Center for Civic Design. Trust Whitney. Uh, call her, email her, and and the team, and uh, just say help. Uh, I really want to do this. I don't know where to begin. And as you can tell, Whitney is just very, what I say, creamy peanut butter. Just very easy to talk to and will listen and will work with you 110%. Um, she just really um, made me feel comfortable and confident that this was going to work and if I had any issues whatsoever to give her a call. So I highly recommend you do that. Great, thanks. Um, ben? Yeah, I would just say that um, content informs design. So as you're going through, and it's so easy to get caught up in the design elements, and, and um, it is addicting, and, and it's fun. It's a nice refresher from um, some of the other mundane things that, that we do, but um, the content is really what's important, and the content um, – Streamlining it and making it easier to read and more accessible are the things that should really drive the, the, design, the design decisions that are made. 
Gail? Well, I would encourage you to start with a page or a section and um, either using the templates or I've got a lot of my pages done. I'm happy to share them. Just make sure you change the phone number because sometimes when people <laughs> use our stuff, they don't change the phone number, then we get calls from your voters. So, um, But yeah, I'm happy to share everything that I have um, completed so far too. makes it easy. And Nancy, thank you for joining us for the Q&A. Would you have a parting advice for folks as well? Yeah, I'd like to give a quote from one of the people who actually attacked the whole booklet, and he said, it was much more an exercise in cutting things away than adding. Once I got started, it became easier and easier. So I hope that's true for others as well. Great. Well, thanks, everyone, for joining us. Um, we are going to be uh, putting up our recording and the speaker presentations on the website as well as some of those resources that were mentioned. Thank you so much to our presenters for sharing their experience, lessons learned, and great advice. And thank you for, uh, to all of our registrants for taking the time to join us on this webinar. And uh, together we are each uh, learning from each other and working to improve voter information. So we look forward to seeing those November uh, 2016 guides and learning from each other then as well. Um, have a great rest of your day, everyone, and I hope you can join us uh, next time for a future democracy webinar here at Future of California Elections.